Uh, good afternoon and thanks, Sheila. Um, as uh, was indicated by Sheila, this study actually was is a process evaluation that uh, uh, this study on a process evaluation of the performance based bonus or PBB. It's not the Pinoy Big Brother, no. <laughs> uh, this will be this is uh, this is joint work with Dr. Ron Mendoza of the Ateneo School of Government. Um, uh, who has been co-principal investigator, uh, Professor Jen Monje of the Pamantasa ng Lunsod ng Maynila, who conducted uh, work with respondents from DepEd, Dr. Gina Opiniano of the University of Santo Tomas, who interviewed and examined uh, respondents' uh, uh, information um, uh, from national government agencies, GOCCs, and constitutional commissions, uh, Mr. Michael Pastor of the De La Salle College of St. Benilde, who worked on respondents uh, from CHED and SUCS, and our colleagues at uh, PIDS, Dr. Janet Cuenca, and uh, Ms. Jana Vismanos, and Ms. Mika Munoz. The talk is structured as follows. After I, uh, a description of uh, the study objectives, uh, I will be providing some background literature on the uh, PBB uh, and our evaluation. Uh, I, I will describe our study approach in this process evaluation. And following this, I discuss the study, uh, uh, some the results and the study, the study findings and close with, uh, with a few recommendations that could help sharpen the PBB implementation moving forward. In 2012, the government, uh, as pointed out, Dr. Reyes, adopted a performance-based incentive system, the PBIS, for employees in the executive branch of government to reward exemplary performance, align individual, personal, and departmental efforts with organizational targets, and improve service delivery. And again, as was mentioned by Dr. Reyes, the PBIS is actually composed of two incentives. First, a productivity enhancement incentive, which is across the board. Um, and second, a uh, performance-based bonus, which is a top-up bonus. And the provision of this second is associated with organization-wide compliance of several requirements. For instance, citizens' charter, transparency seal, ISO certification. Compliance with these requirements has de facto become part of the rollout objectives of the PBB, Although, when the PBB was first implemented, it was meant and probably still is meant to deliver big productivity improvements in the government bureaucracy in a cost-effective manner. The entire PBIS should be seen in the context of the results-based performance management system, which cuts across the executive branch of government. Prior to the establishment of the RBPMS, each government agency had its own system to manage performance of the institution and staff. And these performance managements are tended to be disconnected with others. Uh, when it was established, the RBPMS was meant to heighten accountability with a set of comprehensive performance indicators across government institutions, uh, linking organizational and individual performance to five key result areas of the government social contract, the results matrix of the Philippine Development Plan, and the organizational performance indicators framework that the DBM has adopted for the entire government. Since 2012, the DBM has annually released guidelines on the grant of the PBB. In general, all government agencies are required to meet good governance conditions and performance targets and commitments to qualify for the PBB. And again, as was mentioned by Dr. Reyes, aside from a study conducted by the World Bank in 2014, a comprehensive study on the impact of the PBB on government employees, motivation, and productivity has so far not been undertaken since the adoption of the PBB in 2012. Two years ago, the DBM requested PIDS to conduct an impact evaluation of the PBB as part of our in-house studies. 
uh, I think you can go to the next slide, please. And the PIDS accommodated this request and proceeded with um, a uh, um, composing our study team. At PIDS, whenever we conduct um, at uh, evaluation studies, this involves two phases. Uh, can you go back one slide? Uh, this usually involves two phases, a process evaluation and an impact evaluation. And as was suggested earlier, I'll be discussing with you results of phase one. In other words, our assessment of the implementation of the PBB. Phase two on the impact evaluation is still actually under ongoing. And we, in we intend to present preliminary results uh, by next month, but only internally at PIDS with our study's main stakeholders, the AO25 IATF headed by DBM and the IATF Technical Secretariat, the DAP. For the process evaluation phase that was finished last year, we had a number of specific policy questions of interest. Chiefly, how has the PBB been implemented in relation to its design? What challenges have been faced by government agencies in meeting the conditions to qualify for PBB? And what are the challenges by, uh, faced by the AO25 IATF and the Secretariat in managing the PBB? As I indicated earlier, the PBB is an incentive meant to improve the performance and productivity of government workers and in turn, services and productivity of their respective organizations. It's premised on both the theories of motivation and known conventional wisdom. For instance, according to Maslow's theory of hierarchical needs, incentives motivate employees. Further, conventional wisdom asserts that high-performing employees should be better rewarded than satisfactory or low-level performing employees. Performance improvement through use of rewards has long been practiced, particularly in the private sector, and such practice is anchored on a rarely examined belief that people will do a better job if they are given incentives. Two broad strands of literature on performance-based incentives in the public sector focus on developing measures of performance in the public sector and examinations of the linkage between these measures and the performance-based incentives geared to better achieve them. As regards the first set, some studies have pointed out that public sector performance is much more difficult to measure than private sector performance given the varied nature of public sector output, for instance, national defense, quality and inclusive education, and the rule of law. A recent synthesis of international experience in applying public sector incentives in developing countries suggests that well-designed financial rewards can trigger improved public sector outcomes, particularly if this is easy to measure. But where public sector outcomes are broad and difficult to measure, performance-based incentives could be ineffective or even backfire. Among the second strand of literature we examined were studies that used impact evaluation methods, for instance, in health. One study found evidence that incentives primarily accelerated the accomplishment of target objectives, but the effect eventually dissipated over time. Another study examined the effects of financial incentive, the ability of tax inspectors to choose where they would be posted on tax collections. And this study found evidence that the assessment system increased annual tax revenue by as much as 20, 30 to 41 percent, even if rewards were not financial. Other literature we examined simply featured before and after analysis, which don't tend to correct for possible influence of other factors affecting target results. These studies, however, revealed insights on potential drivers and the organizational context of higher performance. As regards the PBB, as was mentioned also by Dr. Reyes, the World Bank conducted a study and uh, making use of a perception survey of 4,500 officials, they found a positive impact on government performance. Support for the PBB was found to be very strong across all departments, bureaus, and performance ratings. 
Reports were also made about improvements in management practices, greater teamwork, better target setting and monitoring, and fostering trust within units. But one area of concern was the perceived lack of transparency of the individual rating process. The study recommended restructuring the PBB to give greater weight to group-based bonus against individual bonus. Second, gradually relax good governance conditions. And third, strengthen the review and independent validation by DBM and the IATF Secretariat. All of these recommendations have been subsequently adopted by government. On the other hand, our process evaluation of the PBB involved the use of desk reviews of available documents and related literature, as well as an examination of data on the PBB made available to us by the AO25 Secretariat. Further, aside from conducting secondary data analysis, we also collected and analyzed new primary data through key informant interviews and focus group discussions. We interviewed more than 300 respondents from the government sector across four study areas, Metro Manila, Balance, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. The first, they actually represented three clusters. The first cluster comprised 70 government employees from non-government, uh, national government agencies, GOCCs, and constitutional commissions. The second cluster consisted of more than 100 CHED staff, as well as faculty and non-teaching staff from SOOCs. And the remaining study respondents were co composed of nearly 130 DEPED staff and public school teachers. Now to proceed to some to our major findings on the design and implementation of the PBB. As per design, the PBB is meant to recognize and reward exemplary performance, aside from rationalizing the distribution of incentives, nurturing team spirit, and strengthening performance monitoring and appraisal systems. The AO Secretariat provided us this excellent infographic depicting how every year the PBB gets released by government. Information is first cascaded regarding the eligibility requirements, timelines, and the process of the grant of the PBB. Starting from the issuance of guidelines by the DBM, there are orientation activities conducted for focal points with the information received by focals that are meant to be cascaded to all staff in the respective agencies. The agencies then prepare reports and supporting evidence with the aim of getting the PBB. And if they comply with all the requirements within the set deadline, the agency reports are then validated by the IATF, which monitors and subsequently issues an eligibility report, ranks the agencies, and then prepares the requisite budget and finally releases the PBB to the qualified agencies and personnel. As per our interviews across all the three clusters of respondents, the PBB guidelines and information about the PBB requirements reporting deadlines are supposed to be cascaded to everyone. But respondents pointed out that there are not enough mechanisms to ensure that this is happening effectively. The AO Secretariat and the study respondents pointed out that the eligibility requirements have been pabago-bago across the years, PBB. The PBB was clearly used as a carrot to push for the adoption of a number of efficiency and productivity enhancing standards and reforms. It was noted also that how agencies were being rated and ranked also was pabago-bago. It, was, it kept changing across the years. At the onset, during 2014-2015, requirements were less stringent compared to more years when even the PBB is now requiring everyone to have ISO certified quality management systems in place. In fairness, though, this ISO certification was to, supposed to have been a directive during the time of President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, but few institutions actually carried this out. And so the PBB was used as the carrot. The amount of PBB incentives received by employees have also been pabago-bago. They have varied from a fixed nominal amount in 2012 to 2015 to a percentage of the salary of the employees in more recent years with an employee receiving either 
57.5%, may butal pa, no? And 50% of his or her salary depending on the ranking of his or her delivery unit. Eligibility rates for na national government agencies across time confirm that in the initial years, it was easier to get the PBB. But in recent years, the PBB eligibility was tightened. The same goes for SOOCs, where we even see a, a much more clearly a decreasing trend in the eligibility rates since 2015. In 2017, there was even an enormous drop in both the number of eligible SOOCs and the eligibility rates. I actually immediately thought that was probably you know, on account of the ISO certification. Data from the AO25 Secretariat confirmed my suspicions that the requirement for ISO certification has been a contributing factor as to why agencies and SOOCs were ineligible to receive the grant in 2016 and 2017. In the period 2012 to 2018, appropriations for the PBB averaged 13 billion per year for a total of 92.2 billion. From 2012 to 2015, about 82% of these appropriations were released. In 2016, less than half of the appropriations were released due to a delay in submission of requirements from a major department with a huge bureaucracy but this was subsequently released in succeeding years. And now to summarize results of interviews gathered. Many of those we interviewed from NGAs, GOCCs, and constitutional commissions acknowledged that the AO25 IATF provided their agencies with information on the PBB operational procedures, which usually got disseminated in general assemblies by focals. The operational procedures were generally described as well-established and compliance was reported to be high, but there were reports that some of these guidelines were vague and some of the forms are quite difficult to fill out. Also, while the PBB was meant to foster a culture of excellence, there were reports of unintended consequences, including jealousy over incentives received by others, a perception of arbitrariness in ratings, and a tendency to increase over time just to fulfill the many documentation requirements for the PBB. Instead of putting efforts on, the performing, on performing their main tasks, employees and agencies tend to focus on the needed PBB documentations. All respondents also shared that there had been increasing number of requirements through the years, and some respondents described the increase of these requirements as being more stringent, hence making it more difficult for agencies to become eligible for the PBB. On a more positive perspective, one respondent described the increase in requirements as improvements of the process and or requirements. A number of agencies had mentioned that the QMS ISO requirement as a reason for their ineligibility. Some respondents also reported having made schemes of sharing the incentives just to pacify employees who are not among the better or best departments. A majority of the respondents noted that the PBB has met its overall objectives, providing a strong motivation to comply but they hope that the implementation processes can still be improved. In SOOCs, respondents noted that there are several factors at implementing the implementation of the PBB, such as the high volume of documentary requirements and the underutilization of IT systems for PBB concerns. Over the years, SOOCs have also noticed that the many quality assurance mechanisms that the government requires have varying reporting formats, making documentary compliance very challenging and burdensome. Furthermore, respondents also reported that the PBB guidelines don't respond to SOOCs operational context. For instance, some normal colleges have to outsource experts in planning, unlike technological SOOCs who have an available pool of expert engineers. For SOOCs with multiple campuses, monitoring and evaluation of whether everyone can provide reports on time is also more difficult. Also, since focals normally change annually, this results in problems to communicate 
the PBB guidelines effectively in SOCs. Aside from the PBB, there are also incentives available for faculty, especially in the conduct of research. Some had pointed out that ironically, they would be getting individual re re rewards in research and teaching, and yet they would not qualify for any PBB simply because they are part of a SOC that did not qualify for the bonus. For the DepEd cluster, teachers and school heads and principals all agree that the objectives of the PBB are being met. But it has been noticed that the PBB is often viewed as compensation for having done more work rather than for having done work better. During the interviews, respond, uh, respondents asserted that school key performance indicators such as NAT scores and dropout rates are being misreported and or manipulated just to meet the PBB. Several report that the PBB is being gamed by freeloaders, by some principals who take the path of least resistance, telling re teachers that satisfactory ratings is enough to receive the PBB. And because parameters for small and big schools are the same, so small schools have better chances of getting higher ranking or PBB payouts. Some teachers also report that they don't understand how schools are ranked or how they could improve their ranking, and thus the PBB can foster in Gitan. Some teachers even assert that their principals don't understand the PBB and hence they fail to cascade information to subordinates. Teaching personnel are reportedly being tasked to perform liquidation tasks and other clerical tasks pertaining to PBB which sometimes compels them to abandon their teaching responsibilities. Some complain of the arbitrary date of release of PBB payouts and even coined the term paasa buwan buwan. Recently, we re-examined our FGDs in the DepEd cluster using the NVivo software for qualitative data analysis. And we have come up with a visualization of top of mind words that come to mind when respondents hear the term PBB. On the left, we see very clearly that the PBB tends to be viewed largely in terms of the reward, money, and bonus. And there is frequently a positive view of the PBB. We also tabulated some recurring concepts mentioned during the interviews, regardless of whether the interviews come from schools, division, regional, and central offices. There is a general positive view of the PBB that there is recognition it's meant to motivate, improve performance, and it helps in meeting targets. But there is also recognition that it gets overly tied to targets for learning achievement in the NAT and zero dropouts. And there is concern that sometimes there can be unintended consequences, not only of making poorly performing students absent during the NAT just to get better NAT scores, but also mass promotion to achieve zero dropouts and thus become eligible for the PBB. In conclusion, compliance to PBB requirements varies among the different agencies and offices with different coping strategies to qualify for the PBB and some resulting even with two uh, potentially perverse outcomes. Massaging of data was reported as part of attempts to comply with the requirements. We also see that there's tension between quantitative and qualitative targets and goals. For instance, the dropout rate indicator. Um, some education staff would either resort to mass promotion or to identify students as repeaters rather than tarnish their dropout indicators for the school because this would affect the PBB. There is a wide array of views on whether and to what extent PBB actually improves services based on the views of respondents. Many held that the PVB works by incentivizing more work output, though not necessarily better quality services. While some noted that with or without PBB, government workers will still accomplish their tasks and targets. Strength and teamwork were observed among some agencies. Employees become more aware of their responsibilities and deadlines, having accountability for each other. There used to be a, there could be a practice of sharing of uh, monetary incentives among those qualified for the P grant uh, with those who did not, which is considered prohibited according to the guidelines of the PBB. In some units, unfair ratings are, have been creating discord 
Respondents from SOOX raised issues on the indicators and targets themselves, as well as the prospects for their attainment. This is true in the case where units over overperform, because this provides difficulty the following year, since the institution must not deliver a performance below its previous target. As for the non -go uh, national government agencies, respondents shared that the PBB was babago bago that there had been increasing number of PBB requirements through the years, and a few respondents described the increasing requirements as more stringent, hence making it more difficult to become eligible for the incentive. Unintended consequences of the PBB, according to some respondents, include jealousy among employees, perceptions of arbitrary ratings, a tendency to increase over, over, over time just to fulfill the PBB documentary requirements, unnecessary competition. To end this presentation, given the mixed compliance, mixed perceptions, unintended side effects, confusing requirements, there is a need to revisit policy objectives at the macro level or agency level, at the meso level or team level, and at the micro level for staff member level. PBB instrument uh, generates at least three channels of impact, agency-wide incentive effects, team level co collaboration effects, and individual staff member incentive effects. Agency-wide incentive effects have different impacts across agencies with already well-performing agencies able to respond better and less effective agencies potentially facing greater difficulties in res re responding to even new requirements. It is critical that the PBB be understood within a broader reform context the, um, across agencies. Staff in agencies that are overwhelmed with requirements may actually be discouraged rather than incentivized. So it is critical that reform roadmaps in each agency be made at sync with the use of the PBB. Team level collaboration effects vary as some teams cohere better in order to achieve team-based targets, while other teams collude in gaming the PBB. Staff member level effects also vary depending on perceptions, information about reform, capabilities, and other factors. Pending the salary increases in some agencies may blunt the potential impact uh, of the uh, PBB. The combined effect of salary increases and the PBB must be carefully monitored and assessed in order to ensure that, the, that all of the increased compensation is tied to better services. Inter international evidence suggests that financial incentives are not the only tools for incentivizing better public sector services. In agencies where salaries are already high, in DOH, for instance, nurses' salaries are expected to be higher than the private sector. So in this case, PBB should be recalibrated to include non-financial incentives in the future. We note here that the PBB can be continued, and in fact, many respondents would like this to be continued, but there is a need, a clear need for some improvements in the policy design. Some, uh, here are some policy questions that the IATF may want to consider as it rethinks and revises the policy design. First, should PBB be juxtaposed against a broader state capacity building agenda? Should government focus only on using the PBB for agency level objectives? Should government consider supporting weaker agencies in order to avoid inequality in compliance capabilities and outcomes? Otherwise, some agencies may be further left behind in productivity. Is PBB still effective given SSL and other public sector income enhancing reforms? To address mixed perceptions, could information on the policy be more effectively cascaded from central agencies agencies? To address fairness issues, could metrics for performance be tweaked to consider more difficult frontline agencies' work? To help enhance agency-level compliance, should guidelines and documentary burdens be further streamlined as part of government's efforts to lessen red tape? And, for, and finally, to help uh, motivate collaboration, enhance teamwork, as well as encourage individual level of motivation, uh, should agencies be given more flexibilities to use non-financial incentives to complement the PBB. That ends my presentation. Maraming salamat po.